So tonight we're doing Parashat Kedoshim, a very important parasha, to be holy. After reading about the many mitzvot that concern sacrifices, korbanot and the like, after reading about the various prohibitions of what we cannot eat and with whom one cannot have an intimate relationship in Parashat Achremot, we come finally to a little bit of an understanding of why the Torah prohibits certain things. The ultimate goal of all these mitzvot is in this parasha, Kedoshim to you. Hashem wants us to be holy. But the concept of holiness is not very well understood. It is not so much explained. All it means, if we translate it literally, is that you should be elevated. You should be apart from everyone else. This is a very important concept. One who has a chance to read, to study Parashat Kedoshim will see that there are many, many mitzvot. So apparently, they have something to do with Kedusha. Kedusha is something that we should all aspire to. Not only because it's an important, an important idea, but also this is the ultimate goal of what Hashem wants from us, that we should be a holy nation. I'm just going to give you a brief introduction that will help us understand a little bit what exactly the Torah expects of us. You may have heard in the news more than once that there were people who were attempting to climb Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world. Many of them did not make it. Many of them either succumbed to the cold, to the wind, to the elements, or simply were killed because of a avalanche. An avalanche is a tremendous amount of snow that comes down all of a sudden, out of nowhere, unexpectedly. And many hikers, not necessarily in Everest, have been killed as a result of an avalanche. And what were these hikers doing? They were trying to reach the summit. They were trying to reach a very, very high peak. And to them, this would have been a, a very, very important accomplishment to get to the top. And it's not easy. It really requires a tremendous amount of preparation and sometimes oxygen in order to be prepared to climb and to reach those heights. But this is something that a lot of people want, are willing to pay both financially and sometimes with their life in order to get to the top. Not so much because they want their name in the World Book of Records, sometimes that's what they want, but it's also a certain feeling of satisfaction that they did something which is almost impossible, something which is very difficult and challenging. It does give some people a certain sense of satisfaction. It's not that they're bored. They really, really want to do something that they perceive as difficult and challenging, climbing the, to the top of the mountain. But it's very risky, it's dangerous. The Torah tells us you want to know which mountain is really world worth your time and effort to climb. It's the mountain of Kedusha. There is such a mountain called the mountain of holiness. And I recommend anyone who really wants to have a feel for what's involved, to read, to study, the sefer called Mesilat Yesharim. Mesilat Yesharim, I think they translate into English as the path of the just, basically outlines the various steps that one needs to take in order to get to the top. Because Kedusha is one of those levels that is very, very much at the top. And it requires effort, it requires a lot of work, but it is possible. And this is, of course, not something that the author of Mesilat Yisharim came up on his own. He obviously took it from the rabbi's words in the Gemara and from other sources that there are various steps, no shortcuts, that one has to go through in order to reach the height of Kedusha, the height of holiness. But why should we be holy? The Torah tells us, Kedushim to you, why should we be holy? So the Torah says simply, Ki Kadoshani. Hashem says, you know what? Because I am holy. So basically what that tells us is that if we want a strong relationship with Him, we need to do something to make us holy. Because naturally, when we're born, we're not really holy, even though the rabbis tell us we have a holy soul. But holiness requires 
effort, and this is an effort of a lifetime, an effort that you just don't do once and you've gotten there. It's a continuous effort throughout one's life in order to attain this level called holiness. So one who wishes to have that close relationship with Hashem needs to comply with certain requirements. Now, what will happen when a person sanctifies himself? As he, as he sanctifies himself, he becomes an elevated person. An elevated person means one who is apart from everything else. What does it mean, everything else? We're talking about the physical world, physical matters. And holiness is really something to do with spiritual matters. So by becoming holy and becoming elevated, what we mean by that is that one becomes a more spiritual individual and less of a physical individual. Less emphasis on the physical and material world, more emphasis on that which is spiritual in nature. But spirituality is not something that everyone has even a clue what it is, unless they study about it. What does it mean to be spiritual? It is something that after one tries it out, he will feel the difference. So it's difficult to describe holiness, spirituality, unless you go through the steps that the Torah tells us you need to do. And then not only will you be closer to Hashem, you will actually feel very, very different than the average person. You will feel apart from everyone else. Why is it important to be apart? God created all human beings. He wants all human beings to live together, to be in peace together. So what makes one group different than the other? Kedoshim therefore reminds us that Hashem says, I need a group of people, the more the better, that will focus on spirituality. It's not that I'm choosing some over others because they're better, more privileged. No, not necessarily. I need a group of people in this case, the Jewish people were chosen for this task to focus on spirituality, to, to do what it takes to be a holy nation. And for that, you have to be a part. You cannot follow the practices, the customs of the rest of the world. You cannot eat what they eat if you want to be holy. So we, we have a lot of mitzvot that show us the way and continuously remind us that this is what we need to focus on. But still, we have no idea what holiness really is. So, I think the best way to explain it is as follows. In order to understand holiness, one first has to understand what Judaism is. A lot of people misunderstand Judaism. They think Judaism is a race. Judaism is not a race because everyone is invited. If you want to join the club, it's not a closed club, private club. You cannot be a member. Yes, a certain group of people were chosen and they accepted a responsibility. It's a responsibility to follow the Torah, to comply with the mitzvot. But everyone else is also welcome to join as long as you follow the Torah and mitzvot. You want to be a member? You really want to be an, a holy individual? It is possible to join. So it would not be right or fair to describe Judaism as a race. You know, we are the Hebrew people. Yes, we're descendant from Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. So is Ishmael a descendant of Abraham. So is Esav a descendant of Isaac. So we're cousins. We're related. And we all come from Adam and Ishon, from the first human beings. I mean, human beings are God's creation, the, the crown of creation. Hashem wants all of us to succeed, each one with his mission, just that the Jewish people have a very specific mission. And because it's very specific, in order to succeed, we need to watch out for certain things. So when we are apart, when we maintain a distance from certain people, from certain practices, it's not because we look down at them, it's because we're wary. We don't want to take a chance. We want to make sure we succeed. So we have to be protective of ourselves. That's all it is. That's why we're afraid of assimilation. That is why we're against intermarriage. Nothing against those beautiful souls out there. And there are many who are not Jewish, who are beautiful souls. But we cannot mix if their mission is going to be different than our mission. Imagine a, a man wants to be one way and a woman wants to be completely different. Then they can't really get married if they're going to be very, very different. They need to cooperate. They need to share common values, otherwise the marriage cannot succeed. 
besides the fact that the two of them are different as is because of their nature and mentality and perhaps other differences. In order for the marriage to succeed, that union to be strong, they have to think somewhat alike. They have to want similar things. Even though men and women want different things, but at least they must realize what the goal is. What is the ultimate goal of life? What is the meaning of all of this? Why do we have to work so hard? Why were we born to begin with? Why have to go through this? So the greater clarity an individual has, the better it will be for him, the easier it will be for him to contend with all the challenges that life presents. So here we're dealing with a concept called holiness that is known to other nations as well, but it's misunderstood. Judaism elaborates a little bit more, not necessarily in the Torah, but in other books as to how to attain this holiness. However, in the Torah we do have clear mitzvot, and we definitely know that in order to be holy you have to observe the mitzvot. Without observance of the mitzvot, one is not going to ever be close to holiness. So, number one, it's important to keep in mind that Judaism is not a race. Judaism is a way of life. And if you want to follow this way of life, you're welcome to convert. We don't require of people, if they want to be close to us, to convert. We can be friends. You don't have to convert. We actually discourage non-Jews from converting because it's tremendous responsibilities and you don't need it if you're not Jewish. It is enough for the non-Jew to fulfill, to observe seven, seven Noachide laws. Sheva mitzvah ben and if he does so because God commanded, he or she will have a share to the world to come. Isn't that good? Just seven. That's it. You could be a good person without observing all 613 commandments. So the 630 commandments, which not all of them apply today because we don't have a temple. Nonetheless, it is something that we took upon ourselves, the Jews, to commit ourselves to observe in order to accomplish a certain goal. So in this week's parasha in Kedoshim, we are told that part of that goal is to be holy. And in order to be holy, we need to do certain things. Parashat Kedoshim therefore has many, many mitzvot. It's a very, very important parasha to know well. Many, many valuable commandments that help us understand a little bit how to get to the level of Kedusha. So we're talking about a way of life. That's really what's important to keep in mind. And that way of life emphasizes spirituality much more than the physical. Even though we are in the physical world, we have a physical body, we need to eat and we need to do certain physical things. Nonetheless, we are reminded that the more important aspect of life is in a different, totally different dimension called the spiritual dimension. And I have a whole lecture about that, the fifth dimension. Spirituality, I call it the fifth dimension. What is it all about? It's something that exists, but not everyone, of course, understands it. Some people deny there's something else except for the physical world. They don't see it. They claim, unless I see it, and then I don't believe it. They have to see everything. Well, then obviously, if they're not going to try to, to understand that there may be some things that exist that cannot be observed, they're, <laughs> they're never going to want to even want to be familiar with this. You have to give yourself a fair chance in realizing that the human mind is limited, the human eyes cannot see everything, we cannot see to great distances, we don't have that kind of vision. So it, we need to be a little bit humble and realize that we don't know everything. And here, the Torah is guiding us and telling us, yes, there's something other than the physical world, and it's called holiness. So part of being holy means to be apart, to be prepared to be apart from that which is physical and to embrace certain mitzvot, certain commandments, certain practices that have nothing to do with the physical world. For example, let, let's take an example of what could be something that is spiritual in a mitzvah that has nothing to do with the physical world. Shabbat. Shabbat means that we have sanctified the day. Even though we are resting, and we, you might think that this is something physical, we're enjoying the Shabbat because we have better food. That's not the essence of Shabbat. Shabbat is a holy day. Shabbat is sanctified. And the only way you can explain what Shabbat is, is by observing it, and you will feel it. 
you will feel something different on that day if you sanctified it, if you follow the instructions, complied with the halachot of keeping Shabbat as a Jew, of course, properly, you will sense what Shabbat is. So here we have an example of something, an actual day, one day of the week that is holy. We also have an entire holy year called the Shemitah, the sabbatical year. These are concepts that are directly related to Kedushah. Even though every mitzvah in the Torah is somewhat related to holiness, because it's a direct commandment from Hashem, but there are some that are more, I guess you can say, connected to holiness, because they imply holiness, to sanctify it, to sanctify the day, to sanctify the year. You actually see the words sanctify it. So, sanctify it, of course, just means make it special in some way. How? Well, Shabbat, for example, we don't talk about business matters, we abstain from certain physical work, but it's not just the physical work. It's certain tasks, certain functions that are not related to spirituality. Here we're told six days a week, we're involved and focus on the spiritual world. We work. And on Shabbat we're told this is a very different kind of day. This is a day that is blessed. And therefore, if you want to have the full experience of this day, stay away from certain functions. What's wrong with lighting a match, you might say. It's not a lot of work, but it's not about work. If people, again, make a mistake. that They think Shabbat means no work. It's not about physical work necessarily. You can carry heavy objects in this room, and you're not going against the spirit of Shabbat necessarily. But to carry a key outside in the public street may be a problem. What did I do? Just carry a little key. So a lot of people misunderstand what Shabbat is all about. It's not about avodah, physical, it's about melacha. Melacha is certain functions that the Torah prohibits. In order to experience Shabbat, in order to experience that holy day, stay away from certain functions, behave in a certain way, focus on, on, on what this day is, and you will feel the holiness of Shabbat. So, you want to know what the holiness of Shabbat is? Experience it for yourself, and you will see that even the food that you eat on Shabbat tastes differently on Sunday. <laughs> yes, it's very, very special. So the rabbis remind us, listen, Shabbat is an incredible day. It, as the Zohar says, it is the source of all the blessings for the rest of the week. So, it is to your benefit, not only to connect to Hashem by observing the Shabbat, Shabbat is an ot, it is a sign that one is connected to Hashem. Not only because of that, but you will actually feel a little bit of that holiness. So, to be apart, to be apart from the physical world is something that a lot of people don't take lightly to because they feel that the Jew, as a result of being apart or doing things that are so different, he is in some ways bringing upon himself anti-Semitism, brings him upon himself hatred, people misunderstand what his real motives are. So think of it this way. When a man marries a woman, a Jewish man marries a Jewish woman, what does he tell her? He tells her, Are at mekudeshet li. You are sanctified to me. Oh, wait a minute. He used the word sanctified. What is he really saying to that woman? You are mine and you now do not belong to anyone else. Is anything wrong with that? Would anybody complain about that? A man marries a woman, of course, he hopes that she is his and not someone else's. It would not be right for, for the man to share his wife like some people would like to. I know some people do that. Marriage is holy. It's a holy union. We want it to be strong, we want it to be healthy, we want it to last. Then you want to make sure you are there for each other. The man does not go with other women, the woman does not go with other men. You are sanctified to me which means you are apart from everyone else. Not because you dislike them, not because you don't want to be friends with them or talk to them. No, you want to build something together with your husband and you have to therefore have a good relationship. To have a good relationship, you can't show interest in anybody else once that man has put a ring on your finger. Very simple. So that gives us a little bit of an idea of what Kiddusha is. Apart, because I want to succeed on this mission, the mission that Hashem has given us. Hashem chose us, of all the nations, to follow a certain path, 
and therefore wants us to stay apart. We have a special diet, we have a one day a week that is holy, we have all kinds of mitzvot that we observe, and if we follow it properly, we will be holy. So, this holiness that the Torah is requesting or is, is telling us to be, to be holy, involves the observance of the mitzvot. It has nothing to do with being a better people, or in some ways a privileged nation. Amal had a chosen nation, all it means is that we were chosen for this task. It doesn't mean that we are better. If we observe the mitzvot as told, then we will be holy. Then obviously we will be elevated. It will make us, it will transform us into very, very special human beings. But it's not that we started off like that. Human beings are not necessarily better than others. Even if people are not observant of the mitzvot, they can be fine, fine men and women. The mitzvot, however, if followed properly and observed constantly, will transform the individual into a more spiritual human being. And of course, a more spiritual human being will be more elevated than a simple physical being who all his interest is on material life and the pleasures of this world. He sees nothing else. So Hashem obviously has plans on what kind of a world He wants to have, where people do for each other, where people are not selfish and think only of themselves. So He provides us with the tools, the mitzvot, on how to achieve that, how to get along better, and how to have a stronger connection with Him, that we don't forget He is the one that gave us life, He is the one that created all of this. So, spirituality is therefore the goal of the Jew. That is the mountain that he needs to climb. However, it's important at this moment, at this time, to remind everyone that don't misunderstand Kedusha to mean deprivation. A lot of people when they first hear about holiness or when they read about holiness, they think it means to deprive yourself of food and sleep, litnazer, to become a Nazarite. No, the Torah does not want us to abstain from certain things completely, things that are permissible, or to deprive ourselves. That's not the type of kedusha that the Torah had in mind. As we will see, there are various levels of kedusha, of course, but kedusha begins with the basics. The basics, you'll be surprised, is in Parashat Kedoshim. Nothing to do with depriving yourself. It has to do with being honest, not lying, not stealing. Basics. That is how you begin to develop Kedusha. People think, oh, he's a holy man. How did he become a holy man? First, you begin with the basics. Not to belittle others, to make fun of, of them, right? To ridicule, to cheat. These are basics. Obviously, this is just the beginning. There are more steps and there are higher levels of Kedusha. But Kedusha, holiness, does involve the basics, which are the mitzvot ben adam lechaverol, the mitzvot, the commandments between a Jew and his fellow. And these basic mitzvot act as a preparation for the higher levels. In other words, if one does want to reach the peak, if one does want to reach the highest level of holiness to become a holy human being, he will go through the various steps until he reaches that level. But we need to begin with the basics. You can't skip you cannot use a shortcut. You have to go through the basics, and the basics are in this week's parasha, the various commandments, besides, besides all the prohibitions that we've already covered in the previous parashiyot, in Parashat Kedoshim, we have a long list of a special, especially mitzvot ben adam lechavero between a Jew and his fellow. And people are surprised. That leads to holiness? Yes, that's where it all begins. Think of the following, a relationship between a husband and wife. We're talking after all about the bond, the bond between the Jew and God being strong, being holy because he is holy. So how do we get there? So husband and wife, how do they get to where they get? After 30, 40 years of marriage, hopefully if it was up to them and they could do it all over again, they would say to each other, I would marry the same person. That's beautiful if we hear those words after 30, 40 years, 
we know somewhat that this couple has had a good, healthy relationship. How did it all begin? It's not just the chemistry between them. Chemistry, of course, helps. Obviously, common values are very, very helpful. But it begins with small things. We're talking about building. We're talking about growing. Compliments. Compliments. <coughs> Believe me, I've been married for quite a long time, and I'm always reminded that this is gasoline. My wife tells me this is her gasoline. <coughs> I said, wow, I don't feel I need a compliment. I mean, compliments are always good, they're welcome, but I guess for the women, a compliment makes a big difference. It shows that we appreciate her, it shows that we notice her, and that we're nice and sensitive, that we say thank you, we're grateful. That makes sense. We just sometimes don't realize how important it is for that individual. Okay, it's not, in other words, that we intentionally don't want to say, we sometimes don't realize it. So we have to learn how these small things, small steps build and allow, enable the relationship to grow as long as they're constant, they're constant and constant. Now, obviously, I just gave one example, but there's more. Yeah, a birthday bar, a birthday card, flowers, helping out in the kitchen, and even washing dishes once in a while. Yes, what's wrong? Nothing wrong with that. Changing diapers, while well, she has to do all the hard work. Showing that we are equal partners, that, that one is superior to the other. Doing all kinds of odds and ends in the house, you know, and, and sometimes even compromising or giving in to something that you don't, uh, you know, you wouldn't want. Going to her family, you, you insist on going to your family. It's, it's about compromise. So flexibility, small things. It's all these small things that added together over time solidify the relationship and enable it to grow. So in the same way that it's the small steps, not the self-sacrifice. I'm not even talking about self-sacrifice, that you went out of your way. That, of course, eventually will happen too. If the small steps were there, then the two adults hopefully are mature and intelligent enough to realize that sometimes you have to go out of your way. Out of your way. Yes, sometimes some people will claim, no, that's a red line. <laughs> they put lines. I'm not going to do this. Well, obviously it all depends on what she or he is asking, but sometimes it does require self-sacrifice. You take off a day of work, yes. If she's not feeling well, and there's nobody else to take care of her. It's, it's a, it requires self-sacrifice. Perhaps you're going to lose a day of work, maybe some money. So what? This is your wife. This is your husband. So there are times in life when we are asked to show, to demonstrate self-sacrifice. But it would never happen if the small things were not there. The small steps, the small things that we take for granted sometimes. So in the same way it works with the relationship of a husband and wife, the same thing is with our relationship with Hashem. How could you tell somebody to be holy if he doesn't kiss the mezuzah, for example? Kissing the mezuzah. A book, a holy book, a siddur, a chumash that falls to the floor. What do we do? We were trained from when we were children to pick it up and kiss it. Why? If we're not going to do that, don't expect him to be ever thinking about being holy if he's not treating holy books properly with respect. Respect. So if we respect that which is holy, there's a chance that we will want to be holier and holier with time. You know what's the danger for someone who does not have any respect for holiness? You will find that the prophets use a word which is very, very harsh. Very, very harsh. And uh, we read about it in Tisha B'Av, in the destruction of the temple. And I always I feel very, very pained by how could they have come to that level of mi'us. Mi'us in Hebrew means to detest. They detested the relationship with God. They detested the relationship with the mitzvot. To detest I can understand they stopped observing, they were not interested perhaps, they chose other things where they showed more interest, and that's bad enough. But to detest that I have no interest, I don't like this anymore, wow. How did they get to that point? The way it happens is when there's no respect for that which is holy. So they lose respect. When they lose respect, eventually they come to the level of detesting, ma'os ma'asta. And therefore, Hashem sometimes says, you, you detest me? God forbid, I detest you. Destroy the home. 
destroyed the Bet HaMikdash, the temple, twice. You know what? The Bet HaMikdash, that's the house of Hashem. For him to tear down his own home, obviously he didn't do it, you know, from above by himself. He, he had the enemy come. And what is, what, is the, what is the enemy trying to teach us? The enemy is basically teaching us, you guys have no respect for your home. Then you don't need it. So it needed to be that way that it was done through the enemy. It could have been done from above. Earthquake, boom. So Hashem is showing us everything is measure for measure. You detest the mitzvot, you don't care about that which is holy, then you don't need it. That's very, very painful. So Hashem offers us opportunities to grow in our relationship with Him in the same way that a man and woman can grow in their relationship. It begins with the small things. So what's the big deal, you might say? The big deal is that even the small things are difficult to develop. Small. Why not? Why can't the small things be developed properly? They make sense. They're logical. You know, there are a lot of counselors that will recommend that the husband do this, that the wife do this, and you'll be surprised. They may do it once and they stop doing it. What's so difficult? Where is the michshol, the greatest obstacle in doing that which is common sense? What's the michshol? It's the same obstacle that that makes it difficult for a person to become holy. The same obstacle that makes it difficult for a person to make a strong connection with another human being is the same obstacle that makes it difficult for him to want to grow in the levels of Kedusha. And that is, it requires work. What kind of work? Avodah lamidot. Working on one's character, refining one's character, because to tell someone compliment and he doesn't really mean it, it won't last. Even though he tries, if he doesn't really mean it, he's just acting like a tuki, as we say in Hebrew, like a parrot, right? Eventually she'll pick up on it. He doesn't really mean it, it's not sincere, it's not coming from his heart. In order to grow, in order to cultivate the relationship, it is impossible for the two people to just do the right things without really wanting to do them, realizing the importance of them. And that requires a hard work, hard work, avodah midot. Not everyone is excited about working hard. They think, oh, relationship should happen automatically. Two people met, and that's it. They, they fell in love with each other. Love at first sight, you may have heard. Yeah, but a month or two later, they're getting a divorce. What happened? But they had love at first sight. <laughs> they don't realize that the, the basic ingredients are not there. Love at first sight is misleading. It's, it's not what, it's not what will, will cement a relationship. You need glue <laughs> to keep a man and a woman together. Yes, they're very different. You need really powerful glue. And the, the ingredients of, the, of that glue is, of course, what is taught in, in Judaic books on how a man needs to treat a woman, how a woman needs to treat her husband. It's not something that you just are born with it. You have to learn them. This is a, not an easy job. The reason why working on Midot is not easy, it's not because people don't want to. Some people really want to. They have a hard time with it because human nature is Shadam Mohevet Atzmo. That's human nature. Man loves himself. Man, to a certain degree, is selfish. He cares more about himself. By the way, that's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that because that's survival. You want to take care of yourself. Yes, but there are times when you have to show that you care about another human being too. That is why we have mitzvot. Without the mitzvot, we wouldn't care about others. So why does Hashem give us commandments? Do this for another individual. Show that you care. Because it's not human nature. If it would be human nature, then there's no reason for the mitzvot. So the reason why it is difficult to want to work on our mitzvot, to share, to be sensitive, to be caring, is because by nature, the human being likes himself more than anyone else. So, <clears throat> what happens when a person likes himself? Plus, um, he's uh, focused, of course, on his own personal success. But, he also wants to be a good father and a good husband. What's going to happen? So, we have somewhat of a contradiction, right? He cares about himself. He wants to succeed in his business. He wants to be a very successful lawyer. He wants to make a lot of money, whatever it is. He's focused on becoming 
what he always dreamt of becoming. Yeah, on the other hand, he understands the value of family, he wants to be a good father to his children, he wants to be a good husband. There's going to be a problem here. <coughs> What's the problem? The problem is that even if he follows directions, he will not be amiti, as we say in Hebrew. He will not be truthful. He will not be sincere. How, how does that affect the relationship? So that if you read Parashat Kedoshim, you will notice that after a few commandments, the Torah adds the words, V'yareta melokecha, and you, you should feel, fear God, I am God. You should fear your God, because I am God. What's that for? So the rabbis explain that those words were added by the Torah, because sometimes people are not truthful. They put up a face. Ma'amidim panim. One example. The Torah tells us that if you see an object that's lost. You see a person that needs help, whatever it is. And the mitzvah is to help him with his animal, unload, load, or the mitzvah in the case of a lost object to pick it up and go find the one who lost it, depending on the circumstances, if, it, if, it, if there's a way to identify it. But you make believe that you didn't see him. You didn't see it. You make believe. You, you just look the other way. No one will ever know that you saw it, except Hashem. Kol davar ha masur lalev, the rabbis tell us, anything that is, that is given to the heart, anything that only the heart knows, and no one else can know your intention, neemar bo viareta melorecha. It is said on, those, on that mitzvah, be careful, be fearful of your God, because Hashem knows your thoughts and what your heart feels. In other words, people may not have noticed, but Hashem knows your true intention was to look away. And you, but you may tell others, oh, I didn't see him. He sold the car, and you knew the transmission was kaput. Maybe a few more miles, and that's it. I'm selling it to you as is, but I'm telling you it's a good car. That's not fair. Be careful not to put a stumbling block before the blind. What does the blind mean? Not necessarily physically blind, the uninformed individual. But nobody knows that you knew. But Hashem does. So in those areas where nobody could know your real intention, they may think you're an honest individual. This guy, I saw him in the synagogue, and he prayed shaharit for over an hour. And he was shaking. <laughs> and he was charitable. Yes, but he's an abusive individual. Nobody can know just by looking at his composure uh, during prayer. It's, people can put up a face. People can be hypocrites. Hypocrites is a real phenomenon. It's a real word. People can be hypocritical. The Torah is concerned about that, that a person will not be real. He will put up a face, he will act one way, and really not want to be that way, not believe in that way, and that's no good, because it won't last. So sometimes an individual can put up a, a, a show, not be real, following the instructions, giving the appearance that he observes, but he, he's not into it. Believe it or not, this happened during the temple era as well. You have the Kohanim, the, the priests, who are doing the work, but it's ritual. Mitoch uh, Shigra, as, uh, as a result of their doing something in a routine way but not with the intent of bringing the sacrifice, you know, the, the, the proper way. So a lot of times throughout our history, it's what were observed, but were not done properly. And you wonder, so what did they do wrong? There was no heart there. It was just lip service. They didn't really mean it. And so Hashem is concerned about that. So you find the words, be fearful of your God, because Hashem knows your thoughts, what's going on in your mind. To which the rabbis add, For those of you who say it in the morning, you know what I mean. You should always be God-fearing in private, in the same way that you are in public. Because in public, people want to put up a face. He's a gentleman, he's nice, he's kind-hearted. And the wife says, what? What do you mean he's kind-hearted? What do you mean he's nice? 
You should see him at home. He's an animal. Right? The wife knows, but I, in public they don't see that face. So the rabbis have to remind us, be Yeresham, be God-fearing in private, where it's more difficult, where nobody sees you. So you think you can act the way you want, you can do what you want, you can say what you want, in the same way that you are God-fearing, perhaps, in Galui. So there are people like that who in Galui, the Farhesia, in public, they act one way, and in private they act in a completely different way. So, no integrity, no truth, no honesty really in, 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 his, in his demeanor, in his, in his behavior. He's a chad baleb, a chad as the rabbis would call. He's one way in the way he speaks, another way completely in the way he feels in his heart. So what do we get from all of this? That it is not easy to be holy, even though the Torah tells us be holy, it's not easy. No, it requires work. But the rabbis tell us, listen, don't shy away from hard work. On the contrary, if you achieve that feat of overcoming your nature, of controlling your nature, of restraining your nature, you will be called gibor. The rabbis tell us in Pirkei Avot, he's a gibor, hakoveh You know who's strong? Who we should, should admire? Not somebody that has $10 billion. Because the, the ten billion dollars does, does not necessarily make him happy, does not necessarily make him a better person. The billions of dollars is not what makes the individual, and all that money, by the way, he's going to leave behind. Okay, what makes somebody an individual that should be admired and looked up to? Someone who controls himself, someone who worked hard on refining his nature, and invested in his relationship with with his wife, uh, with his children with God, he takes time, he really makes time, he, he says these things are priorities to me and I will do whatever it takes to have a good relationship with my kids. <clears throat> this applies to people who get divorced, by the way. They got divorced for whatever reason, but they have a cordial relationship. They insist that the kids should not suffer, or at least they should not suffer as much. Let's do whatever we can, as we call it, I think in English, damage control. There's damage. Damage control, there's a separation. So this is admirable because it takes work. It takes some effort, it takes perhaps some um, giving in, some compromise. And this is what the rabbis say, this is something to admire. He is a gibor, he's strong because it takes strength. What did he do? He's kovesh yitzro. He conquered his evil inclination. Very nice. I have a surprise for you, however. There's somebody who's even stronger than him. Be'ezu gibor giborim, and who is stronger than all the strong ones? Ha'osem mison o chavero, the one who makes a friend out of his enemy. Now, how many people do you know like that? He has an enemy, and somewhat, somehow, he did something to make that enemy become his friend. First of all, who would have an interest in doing it? It's not easy to do. And here the rabbis tell us, he is the most admirable of all. Because that takes tremendous amount of effort and strength. Much more than just conquering or controlling your nature. Controlling your nature is difficult, as it is. But to make a, an enemy a friend, psst. But why is that so important? <laughs> to make an enemy a friend. For the following reason. The rabbis intended, with that saying, amongst other things, to remind us that the physicality of this world can sometimes be an enemy. Because after all, we're after spirituality. Ruchanyut, we want to be holy. And they tell us, listen, the physicality in this world can sometimes be your enemy. Therefore, be careful. Fine. But, there's something that you could do with that physical matter that exists in this world that will not interfere in your life to become a holy individual. What is that? Make that physical matter a friend. And they said it in the following words, Kadesh et Homer, sanctify the physical matter. And that is a very important concept in Judaism because this is exactly the opposite of what Asian cultures did. They understood 
that physical matter can be an enemy of spirituality. They somewhat understood what spirituality is. Oh yes, if you study Asian cultures, you will notice that they put emphasis on spirituality and yoga and meditation and all kinds of things, whether it's in India, Tibet or in China. Yes, they want to be holy, they want to be spiritual in their way, how they understand it. But they made a big mistake. They didn't have the proper direction or guidance to realize that in order to achieve that holiness and spirituality, you don't kill the physical. They want to kill the physical. They say you have to kill the physical and escape from that physicality because that's holding you down and not letting you grow to reach your highest potential. But to us it's no, mapito. No, forget that. That's wrong. You sanctify that which is physical. You know, look at uh, some priests these days. They don't want to get married. They want to stay celibate, single. And that has led to a lot of trouble. I don't think I need to elaborate on that. You can't kill the physical nature. Completely kill it? Hold off. Don't act. Come on. We're human beings. We are physical, half physical, half spirit. Spiritual, we have a soul. Don't kill the physical. Make him a friend. Transform him. Kadesh et homer. Sanctify the physical. You're going to eat? Why do you eat? Do you eat to live? Or do you live to eat? <laughs> I hope you don't live to eat. You eat to live. Because you need to survive. So what is motivating you? What is the goal? Kedusha, holiness, reminds us that we focus on the spiritual more than the physical. We elevate the physical. We slaughter the animal in a certain way. We make a blessing before we eat. We make a blessing after we finish eating. Everything about what we do in the physical, in physical matters is elevated, is sanctified. Because by sanctifying, we're, what we're saying is that this has a completely different purpose than what others may think. What is a house? A house is not just a roof over your head. A house is where you're going to invite people and feed them, perhaps. Have guests. Chesed, kindness. A house is not just a place to live, to sleep. It serves other purposes, too. So, just a, a quick example of what elevating the physical means. It's taking that which is physical, as long as it's permissible, but elevating it to a, a new height, to a spiritual height. Is that what Nadav and Abiyu did, in essence? They, they took it completely to the spiritual side, as opposed to... Not really, no. The people who throughout our history did not want to get married, if that's what you're talking about, as an example, they didn't want to get married, it was not so much that they took it to an extreme, is that there were some individuals who were so in love with the Torah, with the service of Hashem, that they just could not distract themselves by involving themselves in, in certain things like marriage. Even though it's wrong, but in principle it may be possible for certain individuals to adapt that kind of a, of a life. But for the vast majority, it is wrong. Because the Kabbalah teaches when, when you get married, you become more complete. Marriage can bring an individual to a certain level of holiness that he could not reach on his own. So for the average individual, it would be wrong not to get married only because he wants to learn all his life and not focus on anything else. But if they devoted their whole life to spirituality and to Torah, did get married? I mean, isn't that in essence... You know, that was not the only wrong thing that they did. Had that been the only wrong thing, I don't think that they would have died. There were other things that they did wrong. So altogether, they needed a very, very powerful atonement for what they did wrong. And it just comes to show us that how even the greatest of all can sometimes be mistaken if they do not consult with with the higher authority before they act. Had they consulted, is this okay, is this acceptable, they would not have made a mistake. So there's a valuable lesson, of course, in their death, in realizing that Hashem is very, very demanding and exacting with those who are holy. The holier a person is, the greater a person is, Hashem will, will be more exacting of him. You should know better. But, you know, mistakes happen, and that is why we had the opportunity to rectify our mistakes with Teshuvah. In their case, 
their death served as an example for the rest of the Jewish nation. So Hashem allowed it to happen in that way, where they were killed as a result of their actions, in order to serve as a very powerful lesson. Bekrovaya Kadesh. In other words, with those who are close to me, I will be sanctified. If God acted in that way with those who are holy and close to him, the more so that he will be expecting us to, to, you know, to act in a certain way and very demanding if we do not act in that way. So they needed to serve as an example on how even those who are close to Hashem can sometimes make a mistake and Hashem will act as necessary to teach people that no one is above the law. And even though they were, they were righteous, they should have consulted. Had they consulted, they would not have made the mistake. So rabbis tell us, when it comes to sanctifying ourselves, sanctify yourself, sanctify yourself not only with that which is prohibited. That's obvious. Begin. If you want to become holy, sanctify yourself with that which is permissible. Don't overeat. Don't overindulge. Because that will help you with keeping a safe distance from that which is asur, prohibited. So the way to begin to sanctify yourself is Kedusha b'ma shemutar lecha, with what is permissible. And that will help you with that which is asur as well. So what's the first step for Kedusha? If you recall, if you got, ever got married, the man tells the woman, Are'at mekudeshet li. With a few words, just those few words, putting a ring on her finger, she's his. That's it. That's a, it's a done deal. The words and the ring. What does that show? That as, as long as you have a will, as long as you have agreed, and she accepts, of course, then it, it happens. And that's a very important lesson because the first step in being holy is ratzon, is wanting it. The man tells the woman, I want you to be my wife, and she goes along with it, and that's it. A few words and that's it. It's a done deal. Obviously, they're going to work on their marriage. They're going to maintain it. They're going to hopefully grow together. But it begins with words. Words that show interest. If a person wants to be holy, he has to first want it. If he only dreams about it, he will never get there. So, wanting it, aspiring together, and of course, doing whatever it takes to slowly but surely, gradually, get to the higher levels of Kedusha. I explained once what I believe is the main reason why the vast majority of people in the world do not want to aspire to the Kedusha. And it's really not only my explanation, it's brought down elsewhere, and there's even a Pasuk in Mishlei, in Proverbs, that explains it. If you ever wonder what's the main reason, the main, reason of why people do not want to be holy, do not want to come to a shiur Torah, do not want to be more religious and observant, there's a beautiful pasuk that spells it out very clearly in Mishlei. What it means is as follows. Because of lust and desire, he who wants to stay separate, who's not interested in following and pursuing the way of holiness, the reason for that is letava, because he has desires. He's lustful. He wants to enjoy the pleasures of life. He doesn't want to be limited in any way. To tell someone, why don't you be more observant? What will it take? It will take for you to stay away from this and to do this. That's not easy. It's limiting him. He wants to enjoy life. He wants to be able to do anything his heart desires. Letava. The main reason that causes people to be nifrad, to be apart, separate from Kedusha, is because of Tavot. Bechol tushia it gala, in every tushia. Tushia is a word that describes wisdom, sound wisdom, classes of Torah, places where people are learning and involved in perhaps prayer, anything that is related to holiness. It's called tushia. He will be exposed. In other words, if he shows no interest whatsoever to attend such a place, never goes, does not care about it, that's where he is exposed. That's how you can tell. You will not see his ta'avot. 
You will not see his desires, you can't read his mind and heart, but he will be exposed if you offer him an opportunity to learn. If you offer, offer him an opportunity to hear a lecture of Torah, that which relates to spirituality, he will be exposed, he will not show any interest. So that is the reason, ta'avot. People have desires, people want to enjoy life, all the pleasures, and therefore spirituality is opposed to that. It, it changes the focus of life into something completely different, and not everybody's interested. So what do we do if somebody does have an interest? What do we tell him to do? How, do we, how does he begin? So we said, you have to have a will. So he does. He has a will, he says, I want it, I aspire to it, I want to become holy. What now? So we started in the very beginning by explaining that it all begins with the basics. You can't just jump. It begins with the basics. So what is the basics? We said not to lie, not to cheat, not to steal. But that's not easy either, because we said before that even those basic things are difficult to get to if a person has not worked on his character. So how do we begin working on the character? We tell them, don't be angry, don't be jealous. No. The Torah gives us the recipe. <coughs> in this week's parasha, the Torah tells us in different words that if you're lacking love for another human being, if you cannot develop friendship with another human being, you will never be able to have a strong relationship with God. Whoever is lacking in friendship, he cannot have a true friend, he cannot, or is not interested in, in being very good friends with even one human being, he can never achieve the love with Hashem. He cannot have it with a human being. How is he going to have it with God who he does not see? So we, he needs to develop a strong relationship with at least one human being. Which the Torah says, therefore, this is Rasha. Love your fellow Jew <coughs> as yourself. What does that mean? How could you love somebody like you love yourself? So the commentaries all say it doesn't mean to actually love. It means whatever you don't want them to do to you, don't do unto others. You want people to treat you fairly, you want people to visit you when you're sick, to be nice to you, you be nice to others. You visit them when they're sick. That shows love, that shows you care. In Judaism, love means to care about another individual. To show him that you care about him, that he's an equal. <coughs> You're concerned, truly concerned about his well-being. Rabbis tell us, you may not be able to do it to the entire world equally, so acquire for yourself a friend. What does it mean to acquire? Even if it costs money, yes. Even if it means you have to spend on him. Some people don't like to do that. Let him buy me lunch. Why should I buy him lunch? People don't like to spend money, especially if they're stingy. No. You want a friend, you have to be a friend. It sometimes requires money. It requires spending. It requires taking the, the car and, and, yes, filling your tank or going on a bus or, or walking a few miles on Shabbat if you have to, to visit him in the hospital. Show it. Prove it that you're his friend. Not just visit him <clears throat> when, when you feel like it. Or if he invited you for a wedding, as I already explained before, some people love to go to weddings because they'll have a good meal. He's going for the food, not for anything else. Friendship. Develop that friendship, at least with one human being. Show that you really care about another individual. Now, of course, a husband and wife can be that team where they care a lot about each other. But the nature of men and women sometimes is such that the wife is not always the man's best friend, even though he cares a lot about her. There are certain things that he may want to share with another man. She may want to share certain things with another woman. Nothing wrong with that. As long as the husband and wife respect each other, they have a good relationship, it's understood that certain things they may not be able to, to share. They can talk about it, but perhaps the solution will come from another man or another woman, for the woman. Acquire for yourself a good friend. It doesn't mean just one. Of course, be a good friend to everyone, but show that solid friendship to at least one human being. Care about him, be concerned about his well-being. And this will help us, as Rabbi Akiva says, this is a very important principle in the Torah, because this helps us observe all the other misfortunes. This will help us eliminate jealousy and hatred and divisiveness, anger, because we care about another individual. But what if he's full of many faults? Well, if he's full of many faults, then first of all, perhaps you should pray for him and feel bad for him. 
don't ridicule him, don't make fun of him. If anything, feel bad for him. Maybe he needs help. But why ridicule him? For what reason? It's still very, very difficult to tell somebody not to ridicule or to criticize. It's difficult because people are upset. So what do you do to overcome that? So the, so the Torah tells us in this week's parasha a very important rule that will help us deal with people who sometimes make us upset, who act in a way that is contrary to our wishes. The Torah says, judge your friend, the tzedek, in a righteous way, in a just way. So the rabbis tell us, you know what that means? That do not give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to share with you a quick story that illustrates this point of how important it is to, sh to give people the benefit of the doubt. We this will avoid a lot of pitfalls. There was a Jewish woman who was at the airport before she was boarding a flight. As you know, a lot of times there's half an hour before you sit down right outside the, the gate. So she had her purse that she left because she had to go to the restroom. So she left it there next to another religious guy. And uh, in her purse, she had some wafers that she was eating from. When she comes back from the restroom, she sees that the guy is eating her wafers. And she feels terrible about it, but she's not going to say anything. She sits down and she says, well, if he's eating, I better eat some too, otherwise he's going to eat all of them. So she takes one too, he takes one, he, she takes the other one. Here, they're all eating wafers and she feels terrible that he's eating more. He's not even ashamed that she's sitting there and he's continuing to eat from her wafers. There's one wafer left. The guy takes that last wafer and breaks it in half and gives her <laughs> the other half. And he's, now she's really mad, but she held herself back. You see how strong she was? She held herself back, but she couldn't take it. She was very upset, very upset. Anyway, she, they board. She goes and takes her seat. As she's about to put her purse down, she notices that the entire package of wafers is in her purse. The guy was eating his own wafers all along. The exact same wafers and here she was suspecting that he was eating from her wafers. Her wafers were intact in her purse. Go figure that one out. You have to give people the benefit of the doubt. You never know. You never really know what's going on, what's behind a person's motives, why this may be happening. You have to Give people the benefit of the doubt. People have to learn to be a little bit trusting, not very trusting, but a little bit trusting of others. Sometimes it requires that a person go out of his way, as we said before, to prove that you're loyal, even though you might complain, well, why should I be so loyal if he's not so loyal? Sometimes you gotta do it anyway, because how is that person gonna learn? If you are better than another person, then you be the example from whom she or he will learn doesn't mean that just because he's not like that, then you don't have to be like that. Loyalty means that you're going to be loyal regardless. You have, to, you have to teach. You have to be an example. And sometimes people will learn because of the example of the other. Give them a chance to learn. A lot of our forefathers did all kinds of things to show their loyalty to Hashem. They broke through the ice when it was cold in order to immerse in the mikveh, even when it was difficult. To be kind sometimes requires to do difficult things for another individual. It's not only when it's easy and comfortable for you that you're kind. What if it's difficult for you? That's when you show that you're really caring and sensitive about another individual. Even if it's painful and hard for you, you're still kind. So sometimes it does require self-sacrifices. A person, by the way, that does work hard, it shows that he really is sincere and truthful about becoming a better person. If he doesn't have any interest and no matter what he tries it will not work. You have to have an interest to be holy to be a better person. Anyway, just like to finish with what the Mesilat Yesharim says, we said in the very beginning it's a very valuable book to learn from, Path of the Just. He says that Kedusha Tchilata Avodah Val Sofa Gmul. Holiness in the very beginning is Avodah, is work. It takes effort, but in the end it's a Gmul. It, it will be a Matana, it will be a gift to you. If you make an effort, then you will be assisted from above. Asto harikat as harikat, right? You say in Farsi. You begin with the harikat, you begin with the effort, and you will see that God will bless you. Kola Whoever sanctifies himself down here below, they will sanctify him from above. 
whoever sanctifies him, himself a little bit, they will sanctify him a lot. It all begins with an effort, it all begins with a desire and with the interest to want to. And that is why the Torah says, Ketoshim to you, not only as an imperative, be holy, but also as a promise. If you make all the effort necessary to grow and to climb the levels of Kedusha, in the end you will become a Zatashem holy.